Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Roy Evans of the Jericho Broadcast Networks, and I am here with Mr. Darren Reed, who is the Senior Vice President of Stride Professional Development. Darren, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Roy. Glad to be here. All right. Well, thanks. So let's start off by telling the folks a little bit about what Stride Professional Development is. Yeah, absolutely. Stride uh, is a is the nation's leading uh, provider of online education in the K through twelve space. We were formerly known as K twelve Inc. and uh, are you know over two decades in the space of providing um, free virtual online education across the nation to students, no matter where they are. Um, We've since changed our name to Stride uh, because we're, we, we've done expanded beyond the K-12 space, though, though that's still very much what we do as a priority. Um, what we've also done with the Stride Professional Development Center is we've leveraged some of our expertise over the past two plus decades of supporting schools and students and educators, teachers, principals. Um, and we are trying to innovate you know, the way professional development happens for educators. And that we're doing that through the Stride Professional Development Center. Um, gone are the days where, you know, it's face-to-face -face only PD, um, it's episodic professional development, um, it's professional development that's not necessarily relevant to what teachers and educators need right away. So the Professional Development Center is designed to solve that challenge with some unique and uh, innovative uh, ways of delivering content. All right, man. Well, listen, we are super excited here at the network to be engaged with you all and helping to provide this opportunity for teachers all across the country, and especially those teachers that are coming from our HBCU backgrounds, because we Absolutely. know that education was always one of the stalwarts of most HBCUs in this country. They all had teaching programs, and that's what a lot of them were founded for. So, Darren, let's talk absolutely. a little bit about those special programs that you guys have for yeah. the teachers. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, Roy, you hit, you hit on the very important point. Um, you know, right now in our country, we're facing, facing probably one of the greatest challenges you know, of our teaching core that we have in many, many years. And that, that's around this teacher shortage. You know, a lot of teachers are exiting the profession um, um, just just based on tenure. You know, they're, they're retiring and moving on. And then you have, you know, our existing teachers who are, who are being taxed and stressed, you know, particularly post-COVID with, you know, increasing demands, um, challenges that they're facing in the classroom, and a host of other, other uh, issues that, that they struggle with. And, um, we need good teachers and we need to support the teachers that we have. So the two things that we're doing um, is that we know first year teachers among all teachers are among the first to leave the profession uh, within the first five years. I think they do um, at, at a 44% rate, which is just scary to think that folks are, you know, graduated, want to go in a classroom and make a difference, but, you know, feel like they need to leave within the first five years because it's so challenging. So we want to support them. Um, obviously, as a new teacher, your school that you 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 work, you, where you work your first year, the district where you work, there will be some professional development support to assist you. But we want to go a step further. We want to help every teacher in the country get off to a strong start uh, to their first year and have some uh, stick to it in this, you know, to help them get through that first year. So we're offering a year free um, access to the Stride Professional Development Center. It's an ever-growing online database of courses that will help them in a variety of different ways, uh, classroom management, targeted instruction, uh, and, and a host of other things, and the content will continuously grow. Again, it's just another resource that allows them to sharpen their practice, to feel like they're supported, uh, because the research says that teachers are leaving in large part because they don't feel like they get enough professional support. So we really hope that helps new teachers. So again, this is for any new teacher who just graduated in the country. All you have to do is go to our site and uh, sign on using the Teachers Win uh, uh, discount at, at, at checkout. Also, we have a, a, another campaign where during Teacher Appreciate Teacher Appreciation Week, we gifted uh, all teachers in the country, no matter where you are, six months free professional development center access. Uh, but we're doing a special thing with through you, our partnership with the B, BCSN and our, our uh, HBCU graduates, and, and also the schools that you work with. We want any teacher in the country who, who, who you know, through our partnership, um, gets access to the Professional Development Center, and they get six months free using the BCSN 23 uh, passcode at, at checkout. You know, again, our goal is to support and get as many teachers on the site feeling supported, um, you know, to really help, you know, them them succeed and have some success, not only for them, but obviously for our kids and the communities they serve. So 
Most definitely. And Darren, listen, we are super excited again to be a part of this. My mother was a teacher. My aunt was a teacher. I have my my best friend is a teacher. So we understand. I've worked in the school system for years. So I understand the resources that are needed. I understand why a lot of these teachers do take the time and they sit there. And after going through college, they're like, you know what? Let's do something different. So we're happy to be a part of this to help you guys change that. So ladies and gentlemen, here's all you guys need to do. All you need to do is take a look and go to the link that's right below us right now and see what you're going to do. You're going to see two links on the page now, just to make sure. The top one takes you to their professional development page homepage that will let you know about some of the things that are happening there and the things that you have access to. Go to the second link that says teacher appreciation. That will take you directly to the content page where you can sign up and get your free year if you're a new teacher and your free six months if you're an existing teacher. Let's show them how we utilize resources and we make sure that we take time for those folks who are HBCU alum and use this. And let's see what Stride has to offer. We're excited about it. We know you will be too. Darren, is there anything else that you'd like to say to the folks? No, I mean, just, you know, as a teacher myself, you know, and and um, understanding the need. Um, and, and of course, with the, you know, the, the diversity that's needed in our teaching core across the country, you know, I know our HBCU teacher graduates are just, you uh, exactly what we need in our community. So I really encourage them and just glad to be doing this partnership with you all. All right. Yeah. I love my HBCU. And boy, I love it, love it. I love it, love it. I love my HBCU. And man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. Man. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. I hope my team they won one. Yeah. 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 I tune into the HBCU Sports Lab to see if my team won a loss. If they lost, I'm quiet as a mouth. But if they won, she tab. Uh, I'ma do the dab, yeah. Dr. Cavill, yeah. he know what he be talking about. Talkin Mike about. and Charles, Talk. they know what they be talking about. Talkin they about. compress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love yeah. and yeah. who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor, yes sir, yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach us. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington Charles Bishop. If you see Mike Washington Charles Bishop about on assignment, uh, spending a little additional time with the families, I told them to push along, make sure they get in this holiday break. Uh, we will give you a show today. We'll take a deep dive a little bit. We'll talk about this year, 2023, but we're going to spin it all our way back and tie in some history with it. So we'll go all the way back to 1913 with some History, as you know, 110 years for the SIEC, Southern Indian Collegian Athletic Conference. They just celebrated this past year. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Talk about those HBCU football champions over the years, decades that passed, that concluded uh, with the Florida a and Rattlers winning it in 2023. Uh, shout out to them. Winning it as a member of the Southwestern Athletic Conference over the MIAC. Bringing back a little pride to the swag. Yeah, all that history back there. Look at that. Look at that. Yeah, the Rattlers. Rattlers. Shout out to the Rattlers. Uh, A.D. Drew showing you a lot of pride, as he should be, as well as our producer Roy in the background. They continue to strike. Uh, and with that being said, when you look at some of the momentum they've got <laughs> the signing day, along with a couple of other teams in the East, boy, I tell you, doesn't look like there might be much change as things continue to push forward. We might be doing this in a whole big rewind, doing it all again in 2024. We shall see as they do kick things off in the BX Swag Challenge in 2024 versus the Norfolk State Spartans, the Rattlers. That should be fascinating on one side of it. But with that being said, welcome to episode 474 of Inside the HBC Sports Lab radio show and podcast, the show that's covering the sporting. HBC Dash for all things HBC sports for institutions large and small. From the NAIA to the NCA, we share insights and information on the HBC sports culture, HBC athletic aesthetics to facilitate the story of HBC athletic programs and the business of HBC sports. In short, we just call it HBC sports pedagogy. I'm your host, Dr. Kiana Khalil, along with my co host, A.D. Drew. We're filming from our home studios and sending a signal live to KCOH 1230 AM studios with the Texas Radio Hall of Famer. That's multi-Hall of Famer Ralph Cooper. 
in the beautiful home of Texas Southern University from Houston, Texas. Uh, with that being said, let me go to you, Drew, as you saw me kind of break into this. How you doing? I'm doing fine. Uh, for my brothers, Charles and Mike, uh, belated Merry Christmas. And since I'm filling in for you guys, can a brother get a, a plate of leftovers, you know? And, oh, uh, no doubt. No doubt. <laughs> speak, we'll make sure you take care of with the plate of leftovers speak, and you're going to warm them up for you so they'll be nice. Exactly. Warm. Exactly. Speaking of leftovers, Dr. Cavill, uh, are you the kind of person who brings your own Tupperware? A. <laughs> Brings a clam, brings your own clamshell. B, or are you one of the ones who wait till there's a aluminum foil pan empty and just kind of throw everything into the aluminum foil pan? Yeah, I'm of uh, the framework now. I like the Tupperware. I don't like all that uh, saran wrap, plastic plates, or all that kind of stuff. That, that's nerve wracking to me. So if it's gonna be done, it's gonna be done with Tupperware. Either something that I brought it. I'm with people that I'm former with and they know me and they don't have a problem with that. Or I ask for some of their Tupperware because it's usually <laughs> going to be family. So if it's my mom, she keeps it around. She believes sending you back with something. So I only have to ask. She's just going to start fixing it up. What do you like? After half the uh, Tupperware is full, then she'll ask, you know, what about this? What about that? So right. I'm in good standings with that. And you're exactly right at what that looks like which in a lot of ways uh, allows me to say this to everybody as well. Happy Kwanzaa. Uh, got to light the Black Center candle with my son, Deuce, and wife, as we got into it, uh, as we go with emoja, which means unity, to strive for and maintain unity in the family, community, nation, and race. So certainly that's what we try to do for this show, what we do with BCSN Networks, uh, as we ask you to go download my JVN, my BCSN for those that have not already. I know a lot of our fans are up on that. Uh, but uh, just with our family here, our own personal families, our extended families in the HBCU, as I like to call it, HBCU sports culture, the sporting HBCU diaspora, as you know, uh, happy Kwanzaa for all those that certainly recognize and celebrate it. Hope you had a great Christmas. I know we did a lot of unwrapping, a lot of thankful opportunities. Uh, Deuce was happy, so that's a good thing. Deuce happy, the family happy, Faith was happier. So once uh, she's happy, it's really good. So good stuff, good food, good treats. We're all involved. Hope you had a good one too, AD Drew. I, I definitely did, definitely did. Uh, actually did. They were cooking on Christmas Eve this year instead of waiting until oh. Christmas Day. And... and I don't know about y'all, but with Christmas being on a Monday, it was like my whole calendar was kind of off. You know, I woke up Sunday, you know, thinking like, you know, I don't know what day of the week I thought it was on Sunday. Yesterday, I thought it was actually Sunday on my body clock. And, you know, it was all kind of crazy. But I I, I do want to know one thing, Dr. Kabir. I've noticed a change in culture because... I had to go to the store on Saturday. And normally, no, I had to go on Saturday and go on Sunday. Normally, mm -hmm. that weekend before Christmas, you usually find the stores jam-packed, lines halfway down the aisles and, and everything else. And I swear, Dr. Kavir, it looked like a regular, it looked like about a Thursday in the store where I was at, you know, not, nothing spectacular, not a whole bunch of people fighting over stuff, you know, shit, a couple of shelves were empty and everything, but the, that normal rush that we, that we saw when we were younger, where it was like every, every, every person who knew how to cash somebody out was up on a register and all this stuff. It's not the case anymore. I guess as people are moving more towards online shopping. No doubt. That's part of it. I think that has to do a lot of with e-commerce, has really uh, made it part of our life. After COVID, people realized that you could do a lot with that, and it would not spoil you in terms of breaking away uh, what you like to do. So I think a lot of people take advantage of it. You know, most, many people probably didn't like uh, getting around folks, and now, you know, cold weather, people are still dealing in some form or fashion with COVID, so they don't necessarily like to be around a lot of people uh, in that facet. 
particular people they don't know. So I think people now are just like, hey, uh, let's let's do e-commerce. Let's do it online shopping. So you're absolutely right. I notice a lot of that. I know I'm one of those. You know, I, I if I can't find it online and get it sent to me, I'm not sure if I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and your selections are much better and your prices are much better uh, online, especially if you got something like an Amazon Prime or Walmart Plus that includes the shipping in the uh, price. You know, you, you tend to get a lot better price and selection than you are if you go into a brick and mortar. Yeah, great point. Um, and so I think that's not going to change much. I think you see a change of lifestyle in regards to what that looks like. I mean, you think about it. I mean, you can literally, for those that drink, you can get drinks sent to you and, you know, uh, you can get your food Uber to you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure what you need to pull out the driveway for these days. I mean, gro- gro- <laughs> grocery shopping online. and <laughs> Exactly. But the only thing you got to about that. But the only thing you got to do is store. have somebody come put. Yeah. Yeah, it's, to your point, grocery <laughs> online. So even for those that do not necessarily get it sent directly to them, they just do curbside service. So that's half your battle too. Yeah. So you might have some stuff in the parking lot, but people are getting it brought to them in their car to cash out to go. So there's no need to go in inside to your point uh, to be in line with all these cash registers. So uh, it sounds like things are moving in a different direction. Great point. Great point when you make it. Definitely. With that, Definitely. like I said, we'll touch a little bit on history and get into that. With that being said, before we get too far into history and take a first break, uh, what's some news on your mind in terms of as we kind of close out the year? Anything uh, that has captured your imagination uh, this week? Obviously, a little bit is going on about the signing day. How happy were you with signing day for HBCUs in general? Oh, I, how happy am I? Do you know what school I graduated from? <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, when, when FAMU pulls a coup and gets people to go across the railroad tracks and come south in Tallahassee, whereas so many times people have gone north in Tallahassee to, to the school on the north side of the railroad tracks. I mean, what more could you want, not only as a, as a Rattler, but just as an HBCU in general, the fact that not only with FAMU, but we see so many of our HBCUs are pulling players from Power Fives, you know, top 100 recruits, in their class, four stars, five stars. I mean, three years ago, a five star wasn't even sniffing any any one of our HBCUs. Get, yeah, get get a man a little bit of credit. Uh, Coach Prime did kind of open the door and show people the and doors box uh, is open. Yeah, yeah. He showed people the experience at the HBCU and that you can't be successful at the HBCU and people can't get drafted out of an HBCU. So now some of these younger people who saw what has happened is like, well, hey, I can go over here, get my culture and get an education from people who actually care about me. I don't have to worry about the hundred dollar handshakes anymore like I used to back back in the day because I could get me an NIL deal. I could that NIL deal that I get on the north side of the railroad tracks, I can get on the south side of the railroad tracks. So, you know, these young gentlemen or and young ladies are waking up, realizing what's going on, getting back to 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 their roots. And it's it is it's just a, a great feeling. Yeah. I'm ecstatic because my institution, Florida A&M, has made major strides and probably one of the top anywhere right now, FCS, FBS, as far as players that they've picked up in the portal. Yeah, we know we've got the regular signing period coming. But, uh, you know, just seeing what's going on, these kids doing this, and those kids who used to go to Florida State, and hang out on FAMU's campus for the culture. Now they don't have to do that anymore. They can just come on fam, uh, FAMU's campus. Same thing down in Southern. Those kids who was going to LSU and then going across town to to Southern's campus. You don't have to do that 
anymore. You you just go ahead right right there on Southern's campus. And there are other HBCUs with a a P five school right there either in the same city or right up the road from them. You know, Auburn and Auburn and Tuskegee, uh, Auburn and Alabama uh, State. Uh, you know, there there are plenty of them where that can happen. You just might as well just go ahead to the HBCU. Forget the middleman. Forget, say the gas money. Yeah, great points. And you look up certainly saw so Bethune Cookman, Florida A and M, Alabama State, Alabama A and M, Jackson State pulling these four and five stars. Obviously, some of the bigger uh, numbers in terms of getting done was Florida A and M, and they were first out the box getting it done. But also, I thought it was fascinating to see that uh, also having success in terms of the high school class that they're signing. Uh, Jackson State had a top five FCS class. In a lot of ways, how that is measured is the volume and what you're doing with HBCU students. It doesn't necessarily uh, take in effect the transfer portal, which is a different grade uh, in regards to what you get in terms of your rankings, which we'll see more towards the um, – traditional signing day in February, but this new early signing day in December is fascinating. It's changed the game as you talk about changing uh, the culture and space. I think it's fascinating, which brings up uh, that football matchup that will be in October next year with fan you going to Jackson State. I think that's going to be fascinating to see what that looks like. Uh, and then on the West side, obviously with all the coaching changes, it's going to be interesting to see who's able to jump out of there and kind of take it uh, by uh, the bull by the horns, thinking about Texas style of what that looks like. So it's going to be fascinating to see what that is as we get into it. Anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, one last thing. With a lot of these players that you've seen sign both uh, throughout these HBCUs, these are players who are expected to make an immediate impact and are expected to get significant minutes uh, this season. So we're not talking about players that were stockpiling who are who are one year away. And a lot of these players are not coming in, quote unquote, taking someone's position. These these coaches are actually recruiting their needs. You yeah. know, they they Great may point. not have been able to get a high school class of uh, the wide receiver class may not be as great in high school or the offensive line, a defensive line or whatever. So they're going out and getting these experienced kids so that they can kind of get those high school players, let those high school players sit for a year and learn behind that mature uh, transfer uh, student. And, and hopefully, you know, I, I'm just ready to see how competitive that this is going to be. Cause you, you, we talk about all those signees in the swag East, you know, maybe the East is looking like they want to reclaim their dominance as the, what was the series 10, nine this year. If you count the uh, non the uh, the one non conference game or something like that, you know, where the yeah, East is nine, dominated. Nine, eleven, yep. Oh, eleven nine or something Colorado. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, the East has won the series by three, four, five games over the last couple of years. So the, the East is saying they want to get back to that point uh, amongst it. But j- just imagine, you know, as good as good as FAMU's class is, Bethune is closing the gap. Jackson State is is trying to reclaim their throne. Alabama State. It's closing the gap. Same thing with AM. And then, like you said, in the West, you know, once we figure out the, the, all these coaches, you know, it, it, it's, go, it's going to be interesting. And last thing, it, what's going to be interesting about the SWAT going on, I know we're going to talk about the past, but who's playing quarterback for these teams this year? Because we got, we're going to have a whole heap of new quarterbacks. In, and in you the can take that, you can take that beyond the SWAT. And when you get into the MEAC, um, even in some of the independents, the question across the landscape for me going into the football season, um, who is going to be the starting quarterback for a lot of teams? We had uh, a lot of folks that had quarterbacks being played. They uh, have graduated, and some of the stellar quarterbacks that have been in place the last couple of years, they all have moved on in, in terms of exhausting their eligibility. So you're right. It's going to be fascinating to see, not only in the SWAC, but in the MEAC as well, and the independence. Who's going to be the signal caller? Who's going to be QB1? Uh, what does that look like? So I'm fascinated to see in a lot of ways what part of that is going to become true uh, in terms of moving forward. With that being said, let's take our first break, come back on the other side, and get into some more of this dialogue. I'm going to read a little history to you 
in some ways, and we'll see what your thoughts are. I'm going to go back, go way, way back, and let you know as we cut it to the other side and celebrate a little bit of history before we move forward and talk about this year, 2023, in review. Sticker will be right back after this break. At CDW, we get speed as the new currency of success. Our team spends way too much time tending to outdated applications and software when they should be focused on driving application agility and innovation. CDW Amplify Development Services modernizes software and application development to help accelerate innovation and digital transformation. So you mean building new applications, UI, and mobile interfaces? Well, you said you needed to innovate more quickly. Oh, so he's a listener. To do more at scale, trust CDW Amplify Development Services. Nope. Nope. You want him? Ooh, I like him. <laughs> Quick, the quicker picker-upper. Bounty picks up messes quicker, and each sheet is two times more absorbent, so you can use less. He's an eight. He's a nine. Bounty, the quicker picker-upper. That's a pretty tight spot. Watch this. Of course your Buick parks itself. That's so you. It's just up here on the right. Of course you know where we're going. That's so you. Kind of got a sixth sense. And a head-up display. They're here. Hey, hit the field, warm up. You brought all these players in your Buick? Yeah. So you. It is. There's a Buick that fits your life. Because at the heart of every Buick SUV is you. From novice to aficionado, find yourself here. High quality cigars plus personal customer service. Slow Burn is Waco's only mobile cigar lounge featuring a meticulous curated collection of premium cigars. Visit our website www.slowburnwaco.com That's www.slowburnwaco.com Impress the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love laugh and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir yes, and pay attention, boy. cause he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill inside the HBC Sports Lab with AD Drew. If you would, check it this out. I wanna take you back, 100 years back. You know, as we said, we gave you the history on the SIEC, 1913. We know the CIAA in 1912. We'll go down some history in terms of what that looks like in terms of HBC football champions. But I want to focus a little bit uh, in 1923. See what your mind thinks about. Let me read this. And then A.D. Drew, I want to get your thoughts uh, on this passage. This is coming out of the... Football at Historical Black College Universities and Texas book, Rob Fink, which is based on a uh, dissertation that looked at the history of football in the state of Texas, particularly the formation of the Southwestern Athletic Conference. Uh, but I think it really gives you a global perspective of HBCU. So for Texas, black, college, black colleges, the football season remained dependent on the academic schedule. Practice began after the school term started. For example, in 1923, bishops started classes on September 10th. Once classes began, coaches learned which player from the previous year had returned to school or who planned to play football. Only then could coaches assign positions and work on plays. Occasionally, questions concerning which football team members returned to school extended beyond players to also include coaches. This of college following a successful 1922 campaign opened the 1923 season with the new head coach, L.P. Collins. No mention existed in the black press as to why the previous coach at Bishop Talget failed to return. The Houston Informer only told of Collins' accomplishments as the halfback and in on the University of Iowa football team. When the black press in Texas reported accounts of football games, played, usually the team's effort received more recognition than the accomplishments of individual players. In a victory for Prairie View over Samuel Houston, November 3rd, 1923, the press focused its attention on the strong play of both schools' offensive and defensive lines. 
Prairie View's left tailback, a man who the informer only referred to by his last name, Thompson, received only individual recognition of the game. An account of Wiley's 20-6 to six victory over Texas College, which also occurred on November 3rd, the Dallas Express discussed the line plunging on the Husky Warriors inquiry instead of individuals' accomplishments. The black college football became more and more popular among the Texas African-American community. The activities surrounding the game developed a celebratory atmosphere. Prairie View defeated Texas College 15-0 November of 1923. The game took place Armistice Day, and the festivities honoring the end of World War I received as much recognition as the game itself. The performance by two schools' bands, speeches by prominent Black Texans, along with the fact that the national government made the day a, a federal holiday, received as much attention as the football game. Another factor that helped Black college football become so popular involved the development of rivalries between different colleges. For schools such as Wiley and Bishop, both of which were located in Marshall, a heated competition existed. These rivalries allowed fans to debate which college possessed a better team and who were the best Black athletes in the state. Debates proved important because they existed outside the control of the white establishment in Texas. On November 25th, 1923, Wiley defeated ancient rival Bishop by a score of seven to six. More than 3,000 fans watched one of the great, greatest games ever played in Texas. The Houston Informer described the game as the, quote, the cleanest and hardest ball game ever played between Bishop and Wiley, end quote. The paper went on to recognize several players on each team for their outstanding plays, such as Jeremy and King of the Bishop and Orange and Donald of Wiley, along with individual recognition, the paper made sure to point out that every man who went on the field played hard and fought to the last whistle, end quote. The fact that black colleges in Texas offered competitive football teams and also increased the popularity of the sport among the African-American community. In 1923, Wiley won the Southwestern Athletic Conference Championship. Of the six schools in the conference, four schools finished the season in contention for the title. Finally, the Bush of Tigers and Paul Quinn Tigers finished out the 1923 football season with a Christmas Day game in Waco. Taking advantage of the reduced holiday rates offered by Texas Railroad, 3,000 fans witnessed the Paul Quinn victory. Led by Hub Tinsley, Paul Quinn played with machine-like grace as they outclassed Bishop. While the popularity of black college football in Texas grew during 1920s, enrollment at colleges in Texas also increased. During the 1924 academic year, the enrollment at Prairie View increased to 1,087 students. The school found itself forced to deny, deny admittance to between 200 and 500 applicants because of the lack of dormitory space. Giving you some updates of what was taking place in 1925, 1923, I should say. So just wanted to give a little update, uh, get some thoughts on that. I found out just kind of talking about 100 years in review. In 2020, the Southwestern Athletic Conference celebrated 100 years of athletic academic history. The SWAT was formed, as you know, September 10, 1920 in Houston. A humble beginnings as a grand experiment with five historical black colleges, university institutions, four private institutions, one public institution. The founding members of the SWAC included Bishop, now defunct Paul Quinn College, Sammy Houston College, now Houston Tillerson University, Wiley College, as well as one public institution, Prairie View State Normal Industrial College, now Prairie View A&M University in the Southwest region of the United States with the six joining just a year later, Texas College. Giving you a framework, the history there, obviously fascinating when we think about that. Before I get into some more history and kind of do some reviews of those champions when we started doing Black College Champions in the 1920s. Eddie Drew, what are your thoughts when you hear that history uh, and where we are today? First thing, Dr. Cavill, um, you, you mentioned, I believe you may have rattled off six different schools while you were uh, talking through that through that synopsis right there. 
One of those schools is no longer in existence. Three of those schools no longer offer football right. and are on the NAIA level. One school still plays football on the NAIA level. And only one school that you mentioned is still a member of the SWAC. That would that that that's the first thing. <laughs> and that's wow, how times have changed. You know, those flagship institutions of the Southwestern Athletic Conference have five of those six have shifted their focus and shifted their uh, alliance for one reason or another. And unfortunately, we lost one of them in 1988, uh, Bishop College, I do believe, was 1988 when they closed. And another one, Sam Houston, uh, merged with another college to become Houston Tillerson. So it's, it, it's just interesting when you just sit there and just think about that portion of it, Dr. Cavill. Discounted train rates, 3,000 fans showed up to a game because of discounted train rates. I don't know whether it's the discounts, you know, or the fact that we traveled by train at that point in time <laughs> to get around to to these games. Where now, you know, you you, you the most famous one I know. I'm not connecting anywhere. I'm flying straight in to where I need to go. I will fly in to the closest city and drive if I have to before I catch a connecting flight. That was not an option in 1923, Dr. Cavill. So uh so 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 when Ben Cavill and, and his people traveled, they had to travel by train. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh you know j- j- just to kind of think about that. But you you brought up something and I, I don't know if you go, if you might be able to go back and, and and reread it. You brought up something about football impacting enrollment. Uh, you mentioned that towards the end. Yes. If one thing is still constant, it's the success of your football program and the notoriety of your football program affecting enrollment. At your at, at uh, an institution, and you said it. Prairie View, what was, what was it called then, Doctor Cavill? Because I don't want to get it. I don't want to get the name wrong. Normal, like all right. Yeah, all right. We, we most of us were normal back then. Yeah. Uh, Prairie, but Prairie View State, View, normal and industrial college. To be Prairie View State, normal and industrial college had to turn applicants down because why? They, they did not have the door space. space. <laughs> Where have I heard that at before? <laughs> yeah, you picked up on all of it. All of a sudden, you so, would, as we were doing a course uh, lecture, you would have an A plus. Great job there. Yeah. I the love things change. The board things now. stay the same. Exactly. <laughs> I would be flying in. The only train that I'm catching now is going to be the train in the airport that takes you from uh, whatever concourse you're in to your baggage <laughs> plane. And I might be taking the next train that takes you martyr from the airport to downtown if you don't decide to get rid of <laughs> to take you there in terms of your rides. Or if I can't convince A.D. Drew to pick me up at the airport. One of the other. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> so there you're you absolutely go. right. But shout out to this. Think this uh-huh. think think about this. Um Fisk wins the championship in 1913. Uh, when, you know, when you talk about part of the SIC, this, as you alluded to, were playing football. They were still members of the SIC. Uh, now they don't. They were football. charter members, right? And they're in the GCAC. 1913, Hampton uh, won the CIAA in terms of the football championship. Charter, me- charter member, exactly. And now they're no longer a part of the CIAA, but they're not even part of the HBCU. Uh, with the previous member in the MEAC. Now they're outside of that in the Colonial, just to talk about how things change, to push things up a little bit. And, uh, and uh, before you go right there, j- just to date myself, Dr. Kavir, I was I was in school at FAMU when Hampton went from the CIAA to the MEAC. Oh, wow. In the 90s. And then, obviously, you didn't even have a SWAC at the time. You don't have a Midwestern conference, no MEAC at that time in 1920s. 
uh, uh, 1913s uh, in terms of going back uh, more than 110 years ago. 1923 SIEC, you're talking about Morehouse and Fitz, uh, what that looks like, uh, just to give you a couple of hundred years back, if you would, in 1923, uh, you're talking about Virginia Union in the CIAA, uh, what that looks like. So just fascinating when you start talking about what the place and times have changed. I do want to give you this quick tidbit of information when we look at the history before, again, we kind of go back to this modern time and look at what took place uh, in 2023. As you go back further, HBCU national champions, I want you to hear how this kind of changes over a period of time too. Uh, very early, um, you, you start to see the Pittsburgh Courier that names champions in 1920. Uh, but you have a lot of things, and at first you start seeing private schools at first. Later, the public schools come into contention. But in 1923, going back 100 years, remember the first national black college champion, if you would, by the Pittsburgh Couriers and other black newspapers, or what we refer to Negro newspapers at the time, really didn't start declaring national champions until 1920. But 1923, there was a three-way tie. Howard, Lincoln, Pennsylvania, Virginia Union. Howard, 7-0 under Lewis Watson. And Lincoln, Pennsylvania, 5-1-2. Out of Ulysses Young, they actually had a 6 6 tie in what was referred to in that area as the colored championship of the time. Virginia Union sneaks in there and gets a piece of it by the Pittsburgh Courier, 6 0 1. 10 years later, 1933, you start to see the public schools, uh, public institutions get involved. Kentucky State, 4 and 3, was able to get a national championship. Henry King, but the Pittsburgh Courier named Morgan, Morgan State, that was 9-0 under legendary coach Edward P. Hurt uh, that will be inducted in the Black College Football Hall of Fame this year uh, with that class. 1943, Morgan State continues to climb. They were 5-0, uh, Edward P. Hurt. Taking it back a little bit, when we did the first Prairie View FAMU game, we kind of talked about this a little bit, 1953. FAMU has a three-way tie. Different folks recognize different teams. 10-1, and one, Jake Gaither. Prairie View, 12-0, and 0, Billy Nix. Uh, Pittsburgh Courier. You know I got to put my jab in this since we couldn't do it in 2023. That year, Prairie View did beat <laughs> FAMU. <laughs> uh, before they hosted their own championship and got it done against Texas Southern of all teams because they weren't playing in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. That was a year before Texas Southern actually joins the SWAC. Tennessee A and I, that's a thorn in both teams, uh, was eight and zero and won and got a piece of the championship uh, with uh, Billy Nix, head coach of Prairie View, Henry King over there at Texas A and I. Nineteen sixty three, Prairie View goes ten and one and gets it done under Billy Nix, and they are recognized as a unanimous champion. Nineteen seventy three. You got Tennessee State, those 10 and 0 under John Merritt uh, in terms of what takes place there. In 1983, you start to see things change. Old Billy Joe gets in the mix. Uh, he takes Central State, 12 and 1, NCAA Division II program, winning a, a championship around that time. Grambling State under Eddie no, they, Robinson, the legend. They were NAIA at that part of it, at that time. Yep. I think Central uh, State was still NAIA. No, time. they had just moved. Remember, they go back and forth. They go back Division II and NAIA around the same time. They spent a couple okay, of years gotcha. there. But that 83 year, they were Division II that particular year. Still D2. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Tennessee State was 8-2-1 and one under John Mary. This is when you move from the Pittsburgh Courier to the Southern Broadcast uh, Broadcasting Network. Uh, as they start doing it, you have the AD, the Wire, um, Athletic Wire starts naming championships as well. 1993, Howard could not match what they did as they win a championship. Howard was 11 and 1. Steve Wilson was the coach. And Southern, 11 and 1, Pete Richardson. Um, Howard declined the automatic bid to the Harris Bowl three to, to just participate 
in what was the one double A playoffs, as we know, the FCS and Southern wins the Southern Heritage Classic that year. Um, this is fascinating to me because, you know, it points back to when I made my declaration in 2002 and Dr. Cavill starts naming uh, with the voters, uh, naming HBCU champions under Dr. Bill's uh, classic cuts and splits it in two divisions. So you have separate divisions. That was in 2002 uh, when that happens. But 2003 is fascinating because uh, you have Albany State 10 and 2 under Mike White who I named my second year, gets um, HBCU national champion. And Southern, under Pete Richardson, goes 12-1. and one. And outside of that, they have a unanimous champion at the FCS level. 2013, a little bit of controversy there. Uh, Bethune-Cookman, 10-3, and three, under Brian Jenkins, uh, wins a myriad of about four or five different championships because you have multiple folks doing championships now. Tennessee State. 10 and 4 under Rob Reed earns a championship. Winston Salem State, 10 and 2 under Coach Connell Maynor wins um, uh, at the Division II level, wins my mid major championship. So just sharing that obviously this year, last week, we declared uh, at the mid major level, Division II NIA, we have our champion with Benedict getting it done, uh, Chinnisberry. Then, obviously, at the SCS level, major division level, Florida a and gets it done under Coach Willie Simmons, making it work. Yeah. So just wanted to give a little backdrop, a little history through the decades, how things have changed, and, and just where we play a role in, in what that looks like. So excited about that. So wanted to share and kind of close that up. Let's take our next break. We'll come back on the other side and get into some of the things that you think about, not just football champions this year, but other big sports champions, anything that really excited you this year. Stick with us. Be right back after this break. Are you hungry for authentic Caribbean food? Like jerk chicken, oxtail, red snapper, shrimp, tofu, and rasta pasta? Well, find your way over to Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Pika in downtown Atlanta. Them belly full, but we hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, open daily from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. And on Friday and Saturday, we're open till 4 a.m. Come to Mango's and put some spice in your life. Oh, we've got a good Mango's Caribbean Restaurant, 180 Auburn Avenue, right next to Royal Peacock. In downtown Atlanta. For more info or directions, call 404-698-3992. Or log on to mangoscaribbeanrestaurant.com. For instant coupons, text M-A-N-G-O-S to 313131. Tell your mama hungry, papa hungry, brother hungry. Mango's Caribbean Restaurant. Authentic Caribbean cuisine. As technology continues to bring changes to the world of education, it's time we also reimagine teacher professional development. Gone are the days of one-size-fits-all learning that can only be accessed at a specific time and place. The Stride PD Center is an on-demand library of mobile-friendly courses that allow educators to learn anytime and anywhere. Our dynamic courses provide bite-sized learning and help educators advance their knowledge while also gaining professional development hours. The best professional development plans are those that include a level of flexibility and choice for educators. Whether you're a teacher, school, or district, visit us today to take charge of your learning. We're back. It's time for the 2024 Urban NerdCon. Join us in Atlanta, Georgia, April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel. Special guests include Underworld creator Kevin Grievous, Gary Gray from Fairly Odd Parents, from Nickelodeon, Giovanni Samuels, the Science Machine Michael Green, the Sci Fi Sisters, and from Spaceballs and Star Trek Voyager, Tim Russ. Hi, I'm Tim Russ. Join me April 26th through the 28th at the Cortland Grand Hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, for the Urban Nerd Con. Our heroes, our villains, our stories. Everyone con. I'll see you there. Live long and prosper. 
Visit TheUrbanNerdCon.net to get your buy one, get one free badges before the price increases. Remember, our heroes, our villains, our stories, everyone's con. See you there. Press the analytic data with your hip-hop. If you know them like I know them, they're going to tell you if your team, if they want to love yeah. And who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention because he's going to teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Bill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Both are out on assignment, but we have AD Drew in. And we're now we're going to move it back to the modern time, 2023. I want to know what excited you this year. What sticks in your mind? What were some of the big matchups that took place? Uh, and it could be in any sport, uh, AD Drew. What jumps out at you? I'm not going to go with a matchup. I'm going to go get a story. And... We started this, the year with one of our institutions not knowing who they were going to name as their next head coach for one reason or another. And I'm going all the way back to Bethune Cookman. And we're going to end the season with another one of our institutions going back and forth, trying to figure out who they're going to name for their head coach. Uh, that being Texas Southern, you know, obviously the Bethune with, with the Ed Reed situation, uh, contract never got ratified. Some things fell apart there, uh, at the end. This is a story, ironically, that started this week in 2022. So one year ago, uh, I believe it was on a Thursday, if I remember correctly, but is when the news first broke that Ed Reed had agreed in principle to become the next head coach at Bethune Cookman. Two weeks ago, it was reported that uh, Fred McNair had agreed, you know, he had not necessarily agreed in the principle, but was supposed to be the man and pretty much had everything but the ink on the paper and something happened. So I just think it's ironic, Dr. Kavir, that we start the year with a coaching search controversy and we end the year with a coaching search controversy. Obviously, two different dynamics as to why would those two institutions are in those positions. But I just think that's kind of befitting of the year, the book in the year. I like the way you tie it back, uh, book in the year, because you go a little bit into 2022, uh, but it certainly ties into 2023. So I can see that in a lot of ways. I think where I'm going to go is what just sticks with me and it's, it's intriguing to me because I'm wondering how far in history this will go. Is Southern's buzzer beater over Jackson State. And if you're not careful, you would automatically think and say that was a championship game of the basketball tournament. No, it was not. It was the semifinals. So Southern had to come back and they actually beat Pine Bluff Golden Lions, who has a great uh, non-conference uh, schedule of what they've been able to do on the women's side of basketball after coming out of that championship game in 2023 in Birmingham. But the fact that um, Southern got it done, upset the juggernaut, if you would, Jackson State, uh, that was just getting it done on the women's side, winning regular seasons, tournaments, having great runs in terms of what they did uh, throughout the season, including a, a big game uh, in the NCAA tournament and looking like where they were going to knock off LSU, who eventually would be 2023's national champion, just to let you know how things fly. But that one sticks in me on the women's side, just um, that buzzer beater. And you can see it. I was in the arena for that matchup, and you could see the comeback as it was coming, and you saw the shot, and you was like, oh, that's online. <laughs> and it flash. He was like, ooh, he Ooh, it just went down. You pushing on buttons, trying to tell folks, get it out there, social media atmosphere. But that was one uh, that kind of stuck with me is when you look at the Southern women's basketball program, uh, defeating Jackson State in the semifinal matchup and coming back and winning uh, the championship game matchup finals uh, to ultimately win the SWAC tournament championship. What about it, you? What else uh, is on your mind? 
Well, if, we, if, if we're going to talk about basketball, we're going to talk about the institution that employs you currently, uh, that being Texas Southern winning the uh, – Winning the Texas Invitational, I mean, I mean the SWAC <laughs> basketball championship, <laughs> as Texas Southern wins another uh, SWAC basketball championship. And if I have the number right, Dr. Cabell, I want to say that six of the last eight SWAC basketball champions on the men's side have come from one Texas school or the other. I may be off by one year, maybe five or seven or something along those lines, but but it's ridiculous that they keep that people keep playing in the Texas basketball invitational and expected <laughs> to win. This time, Texas Southern comes in as the number eight seed. Wow. They knock off number one Alcorn. Yep. Number two, and then finish out by beating number two, Grambling. I mean, right. this, this was like, I mean, I, I said it. You do not want any one of those tech, either one of those Texas schools, to get in if you're Alcorn and have to face them in the first round. I said it those last three weeks as Texas Southern. Was coming from number ten to the, I think they might have been even number eleven at one point in time to ten to nine to eight as they got healthy they got their players back and they got their players back at the right time and when do you want to peak if you're a basketball team tournament time and that's exactly what Texas Southern did and just threw everything all all out of whack for. Uh, for the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and let's be real, styles make fights. If there was, I think Texas Southern may have been the only team that probably could have beaten Alcorn oh, yeah. in that tournament. Yeah, and by golly, they did it. <laughs> That's a good one. Since you're talking about men's basketball, I'm gonna stick there, but I'm gonna go into the MEAC. Uh, in terms of the MEAC basketball with Howard University doing the daily double, winning the regular season, and then coming back and getting the tournament. Um, and little would we know that when they matched up in the Chris Paul Classic in Las Vegas this year, during the same calendar year, you get that matchup between Texas Southern and Howard. And it would be a classic that would go down to a last-second shot that was missed by Howard after Texas Southern comes back, ultimately in the first half, trailing by 18 to get that victory. But shout out to Blakeney for getting it done in March Madness in 2023 uh, in terms of cutting down the nets for the Howard Bison. Big time program. Shout out to Norfolk State, the women getting it done as well. Uh, as I was there early for that tournament and then coming on the second half to see what happened in Birmingham for the SWAC. And that was in Norfolk, Virginia. Good stuff, good stuff there. I know you wanted to give love to NIA. Uh, program GCAC. If we sticking with basketball, you had classics down there, both on the what men's and women's side. What are your thoughts there? Yeah, man, you talk about uh, if you had to be a basketball fan to find these games, but if you were a basketball fan, you missed not one but two classic games in in the tournament hosted at Tugalu. Last year, first of all, Tougaloo, the team that did not lose to another NAIA program the entire season. Only regular season loss was to Mississippi College, who was a Division II institution. Got pushed to the limit (laughs) by Philander Smith and... On a, I mean, on a buzzer beater. I mean, the play was kind of like, I, I, and I'm trying to recall the play in my head. I remember that there was a foul, and there wasn't a foul, and, and and they had to go back and put time on the clock. Anyway, it was it was on a buzzer beater, one of the best finishes that you can get. But Doc, that was the second game. That had a fantastic finish. So those people, I don't care if they paid five dollars or fifty dollars, they got their money's worth because in the first game, Rust having to go coast to coast with under ten seconds to go, got the bucket that they needed to defeat um, 
was it was it Fisk or was it Philander? Can't remember who the opponent was, but uh, that once again, Coach Eric Jackson finally getting that GCAC crown there, and Russ going on to the tournament. Russ went in, I believe. Uh, both these teams, I was very disappointed in how they were seated in the NAIA tournament. There's no way in hell you go through a regular season with one loss and you become a number six seed. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to say. And if we're talking about basketball, last thing on small college basketball, the turnaround that Langston had, never in any sport have I seen a team go plus 30. Going 1-27 and the previous year, going 30 and one, uh, 31 and 1 in the regular season. Crazy. Uh, I believe. I believe they wound up uh, 32 and two or 32 and three, something, something along those lines in, in the, in the regular season. Uh, once they lost, they lost in the round of 16. What, uh, once they got to Kansas City, both Tugadu and Langston lost in Kansas City in the round of 16. But the, the turnaround that Chris Wright had, if you have not uh, paid attention, that's a story you need to pay attention to because Chris Wright has proven that this is not a fluke. As he has yet to lose a game this year for Langston in the 2023-2024 season. I believe they're about 12 and 0 right now, somewhere around there. Good stuff. Great points. Let's get into our last break. We'll come back on the other side and give you some more memories from 2023. We'll go into some other sports. We are on the women's side. Maybe some volleyball uh is on top of your mind. We'll see what that looks like. We'll get into some softball matchups, maybe. Uh certainly gotta talk about baseball. And then we're going to close it out with the big football game. Obviously, we know who won, so that was memorable in itself. But we'll talk about maybe some memorable moments within that game that certainly should be fresh on your mind. So stick with us. We'll be right back after this last break. The Cuvée Group is a Florida-based marketing and training consulting firm. We help businesses communicate to their target audience and engage them in conversation. We also help to expand their audiences, which will ultimately result in growth for those organizations. In addition to being a certified constant contact specialist, my colleagues and I are also certified in John Maxwell leadership principles. We use these proven principles to conduct workshops, training, and private coaching sessions for individuals and companies looking to take things to the next level. Contact us to schedule a free consultation. Issues today, don't delay, call Cuvay. When you're looking for the latest information on Southern University sports, the Southwestern Athletic Conference, and HBCU athletics, there's only one place to go. Tune in to the Carlos Brown Show, exclusively on the Black College Sports Network. It's never too early to plant the seed, to share the tradition, and instill a sense of pride in your HBCU with your little ones. HBCU Pride and Joy Children's Boutique helps you share your school spirit with a wide selection of adorable kids apparel and accessories officially licensed from your favorite HBCU. Visit HBCUPrideJoy.com and follow us on all social media at HBCU Pride Joy on Facebook and Twitter. Press the analytic data with your hip hop. If you know them like I know them, they gon' tell you if your team, if they wanna love laugh and who the ball, who the ball. So listen to Professor Yes Sir, yes, and pay attention yes, as he gon' teach a lesson. Yes. This is Dr. Mills inside the HBC Sports Lab, closing out year 2023 with our last show. Uh, we'll give you time back on Thursday. Check us out. We will have a show that we rerun. We'll do the interview with Coach Willie Simmons, winner of the Cricket Celebration Bowl uh, 2023 HBCU champions at the major division level. Talking about that, I want to go back a little series I did. We're going to do a little bit of volleyball. Shout out to Cotton State Eagles getting it done in the MIAC, winning their first ever conference championship, getting a regular season championship and the tournament championship so they can qualify. Which brings me to the SWAT when you look at Jackson State as they had that similar to what you saw in basketball. They got it done on the volleyball side of things. When they take out the number one seed uh, and, and get it done, they also take out number two seed, uh, Prairie View, Alabama State in that matchup. 
and they take out the two-time defending champions, the family rattlers in the championship game in regards to getting done. Shout out to Jackson State because you're talking about a run to determine coming at the fifth seed, defeating four, then uh, defeating uh, uh, number one seed, and then defeating uh, FAMU again, two-time champion that didn't go down easy because they made it all the way to the championship game. Shout out, man, big time. Players making big time plays. That's big. With that being said, let me go back to you, Drew, and say what's on your mind after I throw it off on the volleyball uh, memories for 2023. What got the privilege uh, also, the BCSN Sports Wrap is going to take the weekend off. We'll be back the uh, first Sunday in January. That'll be January 7th with our next show. But this weekend, we're going to run some of the best of the BCSN Sports Wrap. We'll run Saturday. We'll go with uh, some of our best interviews and segments from the uh, spring semester. And then uh, on Sunday, we'll run uh, what, what we're going to call live on location, some of the our best shows and best clips from when we were live doing uh Doing uh the BCSN sports rap. Yeah, Doc, pay attention. You'll be on you'll be on that uh live on location uh special segment. And then on Monday, we will run a segment of uh some some of our best clips from the uh from the fall semester. Uh so you have a, a full weekend of the best of BCSN sports rap to uh kind of jar your memory on some of the uh biggest stories of the year. But getting back to the year, Dr. Kavir. How about that SWAC baseball tournament? You know, basketball may be my favorite sport, but baseball, it was my first love. And being there live on location for the, what? I missed, I missed day one of the tournament, but I was there for the remainder of the tournament. And the, first of all, not one, but both teams in the championship came out of the losers bracket. You don't see that too often. In the SWAC tournament, one team, may, you may have one team sneak in there from the loser's bracket. You rarely do you have two teams sneak in from the loser's bracket. But the way both those teams got there to that championship game, both teams had to make, make remarkable comebacks to, to stay alive in the tournament after they had blown, after both teams had blown leads in games in which they should have won. And they weren't the only teams that uh, did that. And did anybody realistically think that anybody was going to take down the big, bad Alabama State during that, during that SWAC tournament? I don't quite think so. So, And, and how befitting that FAMU and their school on the beach were in two separate brackets so they could actually be in the championship game so that you had a Florida classic in in Tallahassee North, as we like to call it, AKA Atlanta for the SWAC championship. So uh, shout out to the new blood in the SWAC. That's a big one. Those games were exciting. It really sticks out to me because um, this is the second year annually that Deuce and I go uh, as he uh, ends his school year. I get to take him on a trip and it's just the guys out. Last year was Birmingham. This year was Atlanta. Uh, great championship matchups. He got a signed baseball. Uh, my head coach there, Bethune Cookman uh, University. Shout out to Coach uh, getting it done. Um, uh, coach Hernandez. Fernandez. That was a beautiful thing. I appreciate him sharing such uh, kind and great words uh, to Deuce in terms of what he got done there. But just the games, the way they were played, a lot of really good games, one-run games. Big time plays up and down the diamond all weekend. Great pitching matchups, big time hits at key moments. Um, so well played in terms of that, and just the level of competition uh, when you talk about the top eight teams. Uh, I remember when you used to be able to go into the tournament and you didn't have to worry about the four seed. That's not the case. Everybody's throwing their aces uh, and going deep into that. And for Flam, Fam, you uh, to come out on top and win their championship, uh, that was big time. Uh, when you talk about this. So I agree with you what that looked like for a uh, championship. want to shout out. One other thing on the tournament, one other thing on the tournament, for the championship game not to be a 15 to 13 game because 
teams coming out that uh, loses bracket usually have no pitching for those pitchers coming in on three days rest is short rest to actually pitch that game to where it was a competitive low scoring game. Once again, credit to both those uh, teams right there. Yeah, no doubt about it. Shout out to uh, softball. North Carolina Central wins their first ever softball championship in a classic matchup uh, that went down to the wire. Big time plays, key hits uh, as you get it done, which brings me to Prairie and m as they shock everybody and go through the tournament uh, with some big wins over uh, top seeds on the East when a lot of people thought the East uh, really get it done. Obviously, they had a tremendous season. Uh, key loss is they had two losses during the regular season, but they backed it up uh, with going back-to-back champions uh, with uh, a lot of folks looking at them. So that was key on uh, giving uh, big runs there. Golden Tigers earned consec- second consecutive NCAA tournament appearance as they won the SIAC tournament. So uh, big-time matchup for them. Excited about went over there. Obviously, you have the Black College World Series champions. A lot of memories were made there. And you had a key matchup with the NAIA versus the NCAA Division II. Uh, so key in terms of what went down there. Russ getting it done in the GCAC, uh, running the regular season and then the tournament uh, as they tie a regular season. But their first ever GCAC baseball tournament, extremely memorable in terms of how it went down there. Uh, so that was fascinating uh, about some key things. So some of the key moments for me, what some final key notes that you want to close on in terms of the 2023 HBC uh, memorable moments for 2023? And I'm going to tie this one all back in together. How about the story that wound up not being a story? How about the, the rap video in the locker room back in July? Three days before, three days before the doggo uh, swag media day, that was that turn everybody thought was going to be a big story. Everybody thought it was going to be a distraction. Well, fast forward to the December sixteenth to see how much of a distraction that was to everybody. I just leave that one right there. That y'all fill in the blanks on that one. Uh, but but my last one is historic, Doctor Cavill. How about for the first time? Since we've had both the Celebration Bowl and the BX SWAC Challenge, the SWAC has won both in the same season, Dr. Gavir. Not hard, not hard to uh, kind of put this together. SWAC's only won two Celebration Bowls, 2016, 2023. When I go back to 2016, BX SWAC Challenge, Alcorn versus Bethune, held in Daytona. Game suspended in the second quarter due to weather. So we throw that one out the window. So the only the first time we've had opportunity to do it was 2023 when J- uh, Jackson State defeated South Carolina State in, in the rematch, you know, to get back as uh, John Grant decided he uh, wanted to coin it to get back. So Jackson State got to get back and then FAMU close it out as a champion will be crowned and the champion was crowned with the swag lettering on the front. So for the first time at John Grant, you can use this to market this however you want to. The swag has swept both of the classics in Atlanta. <laughs> That's big time. That's big time. Especially when I don't think a lot of people have really paid attention to that. Hey, Drew, I'm not sure if anybody has mentioned that. So that's a big one you just put on the table to basically close out the show, uh, how many people caught that. And that's what, back-to-back for the mix Wack Challenge. Uh, wow, with Howard losing this, the challenge last year to Alabama State, this year obviously getting it done in the mix Wack Challenge with Jackson State defeating South Carolina State. So you're about talking about Howard that has played in both this year and this year, haven't having much success in Atlanta and in uh, South Carolina State after winning the celebration two years ago falls to Jackson State. So now you got it, 2023, such a magical year, turning it over for football, getting it done uh, in that matchup. Wow, fascinating when you kind of think about it. 
Uh, Edwin D. Moore did shout out soccer, so I'll give some love there. I think that was a great one when you talk about Grambling State defeating Jackson State 2 1, magical season, uh, getting it done for SWAC. Uh, soccer, obviously, MIAC doesn't uh, have soccer. They have some programs with South Carolina State and Howard, uh, Delaware State playing women's uh, soccer, but uh, no official uh, matchup with the MIAC. So just like baseball is not part of the MIAC. So shout out in terms of that, but I think you hit the nail on the head when you close it out with the SWAC winning the 2023 MIAC SWAC Challenge in the Cricket Celebration Bowl. Wow. Man, that's a pretty good one. Pretty good one. I don't know who's going to beat that in terms of their memories for HBCU Sports in 2023. I'll be looking forward to various shows to see what they do. We'll come back maybe uh, the following Tuesday with the crew and see what they think about some of their memorable moments We'll see if that one comes up. If it doesn't, A.D. Drew, I'll give you credit, but I'm going to sneak it out of my back pocket. <laughs> Shout out to Roy Evans, all the work he does in the magic in the back scene, making sure that we can produce these shows, uh, funding BCSN to another level, obviously. Uh, on Saturdays, you have Carlos Browns. On Wednesday, old G Strike Zone. On Sundays, you have Brian and A.D. with Sports Wrap. Uh, other shows are coming. Other shows, you just continue to check us out. Uh, we have uh, different shows, getting it done in the nature like that. But that'll do it for us as we close out 2023. Hopefully you have a wonderful year, and we hope that all your dreams and aspirations, you have a prosperous 2024. We're going to say it. We're out of here until 24. But as we like to say, and we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Ville's Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Watch and Charles Bishop every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 o'clock Central Standard Time. Uh, we will have uh, a re-air of a show on Thursday. Check us out as we shout out love to Florida A&M and Coach Willie Simmons with our interview talking about his experience for the Cricket Celebration Bowl and winning that HBCU championship uh, at the major division level. We look forward as we discuss the latest news in the lab. Follow me, Dr. Neotikaville, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D-R-K-E-N-Y-A-T-T-H-C-A-D-I-L. Inside the HBC Sports Lab uh, on one on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube inside the HBC Sports Lab. Uh, shout out to all those in the background uh, that we do the credits for. Appreciate all the work that you do uh, in terms of getting it done in so many different ways. Uh, dream big. Continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. A.D. Drew? Happy Kwanzaa. Happy New Year. Course. Roy? Lecture. Dismissed.